let's talk about the repentant life. What does that really mean? See, oftentimes in the body of Christ, we, we use Christian words. Repent. What does that mean? Really, what does it mean? And so I want to take you through a process. And a part of this is in, uh, in my book called The Purity War. And we're in the process of translating that into a number of your languages. And if you go to my website, Purity War, you'll find it already, this chapter or this section in there in your language. And we hope to get more and more of those out. But having said that, I, I want to talk about repentance as a process. That it's not an event that says, yes, I sinned, and yes, I'm sorry, let's be done with this, and get on with life. That, that's the true nature of, of repentance in our day, isn't it? Yeah, I got caught, okay, I'll admit I was wrong, now you forgive me and I'll move on. Am I right? And that's not the biblical process of repentance. Instead, the Bible lays out for us in clear definition a process that I call the ACTS, A-C-T-S, of repentance. Um, I do that because of the way that the process unfolds. And the first thing that has to happen is that our lives have to be open to the leading of the Spirit of God who convicts us of sin. Remember John chapter 16? That's his ministry, to convict the world of sin, of which we're a part, right? Of being open to the sens and sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God, a holy God, the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, that reminds you that there are two realities in life. There is a God and you're not Him. And brings, if you will, a recognition that you have fallen short of the glory of God. The, the word glory is the word doxa. It means attributes. That though some systems will talk about some sins as venial and some sins as mortal, we know from Scripture that the wages of sin is death, that all sin is mortal. We don't get to minimize it just because you didn't kill anybody today. Maybe you read an obituary with a lot of pleasure. You didn't pull a trigger, you're just happy they're gone. And the Spirit of God who lays that standard, I want you to become like Christ, and that the wage of sin is death, separation. Thank you that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. But that all of us sin and fall short, miss the target of sin. See, the Greek word for sin is the word hamartia. Uh, it means to miss the mark. One of my hobbies and, is uh, pistol shooting. And, and I train people. Um, I'm not yet a range master, but I, I train people, especially those that want to carry in our country concealed weapons. And so I'm a part of a training process for them and so forth. And, you know, and I, I don't know why, I just happen to be a natural shooter. Now, some, I, I couldn't hit a basketball, if I, I couldn't make a three-point shot if my life depended on it. But I happen to be a left-handed, a left-eyed, cross-dominant, and that's very rare, shooter. And it must run into blood or something. I don't know. I don't know why that happened. But the point is, I learned something about the fact that unless you have sight acquisition and you're concentrating on a, a front sight, breathing properly, standing properly, aiming properly, squeezing properly, responding properly, with your eye on a target, with a front sight and target in line, but you've got to know the target. See, if you don't have a target, then you don't know if you miss. It reminds me of the story of the guy who, who was, uh, uh, he goes into town, he's a marksman, and he goes into town and he sees these perfect shots all over town. You know, targets with bullseye, boom, shot right through the center. He says, I've got to meet that pistol shooter. And they show him an old guy over in the corner, and they said, there's no way that guy could do it. He said, how do you do it? He said, I shoot first and draw the circle later. <laughs> See, that's how we handle life, don't we? 
But God has a target. It's a fixed target. It's called his glory, his attributes. And we aim at it, or sometimes we just go off half caught, and we miss. That's sin. It's a modern analogy of missing the mark. And the first thing that has to happen is that we have to admit the sin. Metanoeo in Greek. Bring it to the front of the mind. Metanoeo. Bring it right here. That's the very first thing that has to happen. He says uh, in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10, you are made sorrowful for the point of to the point of repentance of a change of mind. Now, there are three components of what it really means to truly admit our sin. The first is to refuse to hide it. What was Adam's first response when he sinned? Anybody? He ran. He hid. He says in Genesis 3.10, I was afraid, so I hid myself. David did the same thing, or Job did the same thing. Remember? Have I covered my transgression like Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom because I feared the great multitude and contempt of families terrified me and kept silent and did not go out of doors? Job says, no, I didn't do that. I didn't do what Adam did. In Psalm 19, verse 12, he says, acquit me. This is David speaking now. Nakah in Hebrew, of hidden, kathar, faults. Hidden faults. Lord, dig into the deep recesses of my life, of the stuff that I'm denying, I'm hiding, I'm pretending doesn't exist. And of course, we love Psalm 139, don't we? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. There is no admission to sin if you're not disclosing it all. See, we have a tendency when we get caught to give a little bit of information. Oh yeah, but not full disclosure. Just bits and pieces. And the Spirit of God won't have it. Number two, stop blaming others for our sin. Again, Adam, the woman whom you gave me, she, she gave from the tree and I ate. It's her fault. Or oh, God, it's your fault. I, well, I don't care as long as it's not my fault. Remember James 1 that says, when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. James 1, 14 to 16, lust results in sin, which results in death. Stop blaming others. Don't blame God. Remember in James 1, 14? God, it's your fault. You know, it's like a guy saying, you know what? It's your fault that I'm addicted to pornography, God. You gave me eyes and a computer. I mean, I, don't think that people don't do that. Or grieving. See, it, it, that's what admitting it means. It means grieving. Ephesians 4.30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Lupao in Greek. It's that word you felt when a loss of a loved one. Dude, how did you feel? It's exactly how the Spirit of God feels when we sin. When you wept over a friend's loss or a parent's loss. The Bible says, how blessed is he in whose spirit there is no deceit, Psalm 32. Or, or Proverbs 28, 13, he who conceals his transgression will not prosper. Concealing it. Stop it. Stop faking it. When you are convicted of sin, deal with it all. Bring it to the front of the mind. As painful as that is, and it really is. Stop hiding it. Stop blaming others and grieve over it. That's the first step. Bring it to the front of your mind. Metanoeo. The next word is homologeo. You bring it to the mind and have it come out your mouth. So it goes from admitting our sin to confessing our sin in this acrostic of the acts of repentance. From the mind to the mouth. You see, the word homologeo 
is two words, the word homo and the word legao. The word homo means the same and legao means to speak words. What are you doing when you're confessing? You're saying the same thing about that that God would say. Not what mama would say, or daddy would say, or your friends would say, because your friends might say it's okay. It's not okay. Your friends might minimize, or they might maximize, but they won't be accurate, will they? Oh, that's no problem. Everybody sins. Really? It's a problem with God. So, David says, remember in Psalm 32, verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Acknowledging it. See, you remember that God used Nathan to bring it to the front of David's mind, right? You're the man. Remember that? You're the man. Huh. Ouch. Suddenly what David had suppressed for one year for one year. Psalm 6, Psalm 32, Psalm 38, Psalm 51 tells the story laid out. And David says in Psalm 38, for I confess my iniquity, I'm full of anxiety because of my sin. Psalm 38, 18. I confessed it. I didn't just have Nathan tell me I sinned. I admitted it first and I confessed it. I said to God what I should say to God. I didn't minimize it. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. First John 1 John 1.9, if you confess, homilagao, if you agree with God and say the same thing about it, God would say. If you confess your sin, God is faithful and he's just. Dikiosune, he's righteous. To forgive that sin and to cleanse you from how much unrighteousness, everybody? What does the text say? All unrighteousness. Some of you that came out of formal liturgical systems memorized a prayer when you were a child called the act of contrition. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, but I detest all my sins because of thy just punishment, but most of all because I've offended thee, my God. That's a great prayer. Oftentimes, rotely said, oh my God, I'm heartily sorry. The words so profound. Oh my God. I am heartily sorry for having offended you. And I hate all my sin. And most of all, I hate that I hurt you. So the first thing you do is you admit the sin. Metanoeo, bring it to the mind. The second thing you do is you confess your sin, hamalageo, you bring it to the mouth. The third thing you do is you turn from that sin, epistrepho. You move it from the mind from, to the mouth to the manner to your life, epistrepho. Metanoeo, hamalageo, epistrepho. Now that word epistrepho is found in the back of a Coke bottle in the land of Greece today. What? The word repent is found in the back of a Coke bottle. You say, why? Because it means return for filling. Isn't that good? You got this empty Coke bottle thrown into the gutter, dirtied up, and somebody takes it, brings it to the factory, they clean it out, refill it, recap it, and reuse it. And that's exactly what God does. You admit it, you confess it, and you turn from that. You return to him for a refilling. Isn't that good? Because sin empties us up. So it goes from the mind to the mouth to the manner. Do uh, you remember? What Jesus said to Simon Peter in Luke 22. When he said, Behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. The Greek word is eclipso. Wouldn't black out. And then he says this to him. And after you've returned, after you've repented, after you've epistrephoed, strengthen your brothers. 
So he's saying to Peter, you know what? And Peter, of course, says, I'll go to prison and to death for you. <laughs> Jesus said, no, no, you're going to deny that you even know me. Three times. And Peter, your faith is still not going to black out even if you deny me. Wow. Because I, the Son of God, and the High Priest, prayed for you. Oh, you bring it to the mind, you bring it to the mouth, and you let it change your manner. True repentance results in a change of behavior, or it's not repentance. And there's so many people who admit it and confess it. They go to some mountaintop retreat, oh, I admit my sin, oh, I confess it before God, and there's no change. No change. But anything less than change is revival without reformation. It's admission and confession without repentance. It's part of the process. You admit it, you confess it, but you're not done until you turn from it. I've raised a lot of children who are now adults, and now I have 12 grandchildren because I'm really old. And I'm blessed to have so many grandchildren, but i got to tell you what I taught my children is that postponed obedience is really a form of disobedience. Think about that. Postponed obedience is really a form of disobedience, isn't it? He says, I want you to turn from that sin. Okay, I'll get to that. How many times have you had people just admit their sin, confess their sin, and wait to turn from it? that it wasn't true repentance. But that's not all. You admit your sin, metanoeo, you bring it to the mind. You confess your sin, homologao, you bring it to the mouth. You turn from your sin, epistrepho, you bring it to the manner, but then it moves from the mind to the mouth to the manner to your ministry. That's the true evidence that you had truly had admitted it, confessed it, and turned from it is when it results in ministry to others. That's what we miss. And yet we have evidence of it biblically, and it's the Greek word stadizo. Sounds so Italian, doesn't it? Again, the mind, the mouth, the manner to the ministry. Metanoeo, homologeo, epistrepho, studizo. Do you remember what David said? He said, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. He admitted it, he confessed it, he turned from it. If you look at Psalm 6, Psalm 32, Psalm 38, Psalm 51, you see the progression of this. I didn't make this up. It's exactly what David did. This man after God's own heart, this man that the Bible would say ultimately he would die of a ripe old age and full of days. And it's not talking about full of days as just a lot of days. He's talking about a fullness so that he can experience God's shalom. Shalom is not peace. Shalom is wholeness. When I say to you, Shalom Aleichem in Hebrew, I'm saying accept the wholeness that God offers you. The wholeness. For thou will keep in perfect peace. The Hebrew text says Shalom, Shalom. The double dose. And David experienced that. He could die ripe, full of days. That's what I want for us. In Luke 22, again, and after you've returned, Peter, Strengthen your brothers. You see, I believe that a part of the repentance process is that at least to learn from your sin. Help others. Learn from it. You admit it, you confess it, you turn from it, and you serve. And you strengthen other sinners. From the mind to the mouth, to the manner to the ministry. 
Metanoeo, homologao, epistrepho, studizo. I don't care how you remember it. Just remember it. I was invited by a group of people called Promise Keepers. It's a men's ministry in a number of years ago that uh, did these crusades and these auditoriums and, and large crowds of men and so forth. And I was invited to be one of the speakers at one of the events. And I was talking on the subject of moral purity and holiness in, out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And in the process of talking about this, at the end I gave what would be called an altar call, but just basically an opportunity to respond. Before I could finish my invitation, so to speak, a gentleman that was about, oh, only 12 or 15 feet from me stood up, put his arms out as if on a cross, went to the center aisle, and, you know, that always, I, you know, I'm kind of a Baptist kind of background, so that freaks us out, you know, came to the center aisle and ran forward. There's a crowd of men ran forward as if to tackle me and fell in front of my lectern on his face. And he's crying out, oh God, oh God, what have I done? What have I done? Oh God, what have I done? And three or four men just piled on top of him. I don't know what to do, I have to admit. And that entire crowd of men, without my prompting, stood up in silence. Not a word spoken. Because every one of those men knew that could be them. That could be them. I never saw that man's face. Two years later, I'm in another city, speaking at another conference. Smaller group this time. A lot smaller. And I'm speaking, and I told this story. And in the back, way in the corner, even though it was a smaller crowd, I couldn't see his face. I'm ignoring him, going, I don't have time to answer a question here. So I'm kind of turning. Finally, he shouts out, I'm that man. This was in a complete other city, a thousand miles away. I said, What? He said, I'm that man. And I thought he was speaking symbolically. Aren't we all that man? And finally, I got what he was saying. I said, come here. I want to see your face. And he came up, and I embraced him. And he said, can I say something? I said, sure. And I gave him. And for five minutes, he told the consequence of his sin. And they said to those guys, it's not worth it. There's pleasure in sin for a season. And I could hear the same silence that I heard the first time. And then he said to them, but I've admitted my sin. And in essence said, and I confessed it and turned from it, the gentleman, he said, I'm having the opportunity to stand before you and minister a warning. That's the process. He would have rather never have gone through that process. Better to not have sinned than to have to go through a process of repentance. Amen? But should it happen, because we are prone to wander, 
as I pray that God will never allow us to become so indifferent that we don't feel it. That we don't feel it. And we do something about it. What do we do? We admit it, we confess it, we turn from it, and we strengthen others. Amen? Father, I pray that you would just take this simple, simple process laid out so clearly in Scripture, these acts of repentance, and I pray, God, that as we go through this process, certainly we would choose to run from sin and not do it, but, Lord, we know that we will fall short of your standards, your holiness, your glory. And I pray, God, that you would take this simple process, bring it to our hearts, our lives. May it be a practice, I pray, in Jesus' name. Any questions? Is that helpful? Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, I think we could spend an hour kind of sorting that stuff out. Sins of omission, commission, and those kinds of things. Um, what I'm, I'm prone to say to people who want to talk about things and where they deal with the nuances and the complications is do what you know first, banter about what you don't know second, apply what you do know, work on what you don't know, and watch where your life just unfold really, really smoothly. Did you hear that? In other words, sometimes in our pursuit of trying to do everything right, we don't do anything right, right? So why not work on what you do know, right? Seneca, the philosopher of Rome, said this, a thing is not too often repeated which isn't sufficiently learned. So there's plenty that we do know that is sin. Go to Galatians 5, you know, the deeds of the flesh, right? Remember what he says in Colossians 3? He says, if you, therefore, if you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, he goes on to say, well, therefore consider the members of the earthly body as dead to immorality, you know what that is, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Put those all aside, as well as anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech, and don't lie to one another. That's a pretty good list to start with, right? So we start with the deeds of the flesh and the list in Colossians 3, right, of what you already do know. Well, as it relates to anger, fear, loneliness, jealousy, and rejection, those kinds of things. Know what you do know, and then go ahead and say, what are these complications that come with the sins of omission and so forth like that, okay? You know, mistreatment of the poor, mistreatment of those kinds of things that you and I chatted about at the break, okay? That's just a good 40-year pastoral kind of encouragement to you. All right, thanks. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, in church settings, especially at church leaders, it's always a big thing about uh, confessing our sins, obviously, because there are different types of, of, of sin. Should we uh, inform the uh, congregation about vertical persons? Or, you know, should we ask him to uh, confess in front of the uh, church? Right. What's your take on that? Yeah, well, first of all, let's start with private, all right? Let's go through this process privately, all right? Now, I'm more concerned about your walk with God than I am with your walk with people, all right? So let's start with admitting and confessing, turning and, and serving, all right? Some traditions then talk about the process of discipline and church discipline, Matthew 18, Galatians 6, places like that and so forth. Uh, as far as public confession, you know, uh, James, of course, talks about some of that in James, the fifth chapter, remember, in terms of that. So I, I say to you, if you look at Matthew 18, you look at James chapter 5, there is an essence to where you are... Um, admitting your sin and confessing it. But the truth is, your repentance will be evident, will it not? Because if it results in service to others, your repentant lifestyle, and that's what this is all about, will be clearly evident. In the early church, and I forgot the centuries, so I'm not going to fake it and guess, but I, I, I think I know which ones. But anyway, they would call you, if you sinned, they would call you the lapsed. And they would place you at the back of the church. I always tease the Baptists that sit in the back because I call them the lapsed. Um, but, and then, 
And as you repented and proof of repentance or fruit of repentance was evidence, guess what they allowed you to do? One more pew, one more seat, one more seat until you could take the front seats which were served for communicants, having communion. So literally you had to show the fruit of repentance before you could partake of communion. And uh, I believe it was like the 6th century where this was happening, 4th to 6th century. And what happened was you became, uh, uh, you know, you would have to sit in the back. You started moving as people saw the change in your life. They didn't just accept your words. I admit it. I confess that they wanted to see you turn from it. And they also wanted to see you, what, strengthen others in the process. There's some almost validity to that, isn't there? Without it becoming so formal. But there is some validity to saying, let me see the change. Don't just tell me. Let me see it. And so forth.